Well, I know that you came into the city to talk to us, among other things, and that you came in from your farm, and I'd like to know more about your farm. Can you tell us about it? Well, uh, we're no longer actively farming, but uh, we had a mixed grain and livestock farm. Uh, more livestock than, than grain for many years. But it was a typical family farm where my parents established the farm. And uh, I have to say that my uh, lifetime ambition was probably to be a farmer and my interests were actually in politics. So I had, I had, I've lived a charmed life in that respect. So how did it happen? Because as you know, a comparatively small percentage of politicians come from the farm. How did it happen for you? Well, as I indicated, I was always interested in the news and that turned into a political interest. My parents were quite involved in following the news and in a community service aspect. They, they were involved to some degree, but it was my interest in news and following national and provincial politics that kind of kept my, my appetite whetted, to say. A lot of those issues on the news, though, wouldn't seem to be related to a young man farming. I mean, wh where, where did the actual interest come from? Well, actually, the, the interest uh, began simply with, uh, well, farm politics. I mean, there's no industry that has uh, more interest in its own self-preservation in many respects than agriculture. It's a cornerstone industry and farm politics all the way from farmers union to more modern uh, joint representation through Keystone Agricultural Producers and then pork producers, beef producers, each, each uh, commodity has a group of people who want to promote the commodity and promote the well-being of that commodity and promote the understanding of it, frankly, because as we become more urbanized, and that's pretty evident in Manitoba because we have one extremely large center and a number of smaller centers across the province that are mainly agricultural. So we used to feel that we needed to promote ourselves, frankly, to not just to each other, but uh, to the larger world. Grew beyond just talking to our city neighbors, but talking about international trade. If you want a lively discussion, get a group of farmers talking about international trade. How quick can you get a fresh pork into Japan? Uh, how, where's the next market for wheat uh, development of new crops? Uh, and whether or not they'll be profitable, all those things are pretty common topics of conversation in, in modern agricultural circles. So, still like to go back a little bit. You wanted to farm. A lot of your fellow graduates disappeared and you wanted to farm and you were interested in politics. Who encouraged you? Well, actually I had some friends, some of them classmates and others who seemed to think that I should get involved in politics because I had done a couple of things as a younger person in 4-H and those sorts of things where I was involved with a bit of a leadership role. Same thing with the local Ag Society, which is a very small group and uh, I was involved there for a number of years. But when the 60s were occurring, the future in agriculture wasn't really that uh, hospitable. We looked at uh, uh, a lack of interest on the part of uh, young people simply because of the environment that we saw at that time. That wasn't the end of the world because a lot of the people that I was, that would be my peers, they came back after a few years and the, and the community that I live in is quite a progressive and competitive community. That's the interesting thing about agriculture as well. Agriculture as well. We are friends and neighbors, but we're also competitive with, with each other, trying to uh, acquire land or uh, manage things in a proper way. So I became involved in the school board 
mostly not because I was looking for a job, but because the retiring trustee said, I'm not going to run again, why don't you? Well, getting elected on the school board <laughs> was just a matter of finding 10 people or 20 to sign your nomination papers. But I became quite involved and quite interested, and within a couple of years I was the chairman of the board. Whether that was a good thing or not, it certainly whetted my appetite in the political process because we had quite an aggressive uh, management uh, group in the, in the Beautiful Plains School Division, and we got involved in some of the provincial issues, made presentations at the legislature, and of course that was an even bigger thing for a farm boy to be going to the legislature and making a presentation, even though it turned out it was two o'clock in the morning at a committee. The only one that was listening was me and the Minister of Education at that time. I think everybody else was trying to wake, wake up, but it, w it was actually where I got the most interested in bigger picture politics. Now, there was a lot of angry farmers around the era when you were developing as a politician. What were they, specifically, the, what were they upset about? I, I think the banks may have had something to do with it. Well, in the 80s were the, was the era of very high interest rates, which destroyed a lot of dreams of uh, a good many young farmers, and some older ones for that matter. It brought home the, the risk factor that was involved in, in agriculture and the inability to control that risk unless you just sunk into the woodwork and, and didn't have an aggressive uh, operating style. You were going to feel the pain of those very expensive uh, interest rates. In today's climate, if you think about 18 to 20 percent interest on loans, you know if that happened to most household no loans today, big percentage of them would collapse. No reflection on the people that have them, but it's just there's no margin left after you take 20 percent out of it for an operating loan. So that was the main factor. We had some mediocre uh, prices for commodities at that time, and it was the beginning of the changes that we've seen for the last 30 years going through agriculture. And there has been no industry that's changed more than agriculture, you know, from the medium-sized operations to larger, more efficient operations, to where we now see more and more mega farms. That's not necessarily a, a swear word in, in the world, although there are many people who believe that very large farms are, are taking over more land than, than they should be. I believe that there's a it, there's a balance that's still out there. There's a lot of very good, very efficient, medium-sized farms that in the 60s, when I was first starting to farm, would have, been, would have been beyond what we thought would be possible because of technology and, and uh, modern equipment now. Even a medium-sized farm operation is very efficient and uh, if they're well run, they're a very good operation for the community. So you started off with a spirit of uh, service to the farm community. Is that fair to say that? Yes, that was the, one of the motivating factors. Um, there were a number of us who got elected in 86 who all came from a rural background. There was uh, from Portage to Prairie where Ed Connery was to the western fringe of the province where Len Durkash was. And, Myself and Glenn Finley were in the middle at Nipawan Newdale. We all were very motivated to see what was possible to improve government and improve the opportunities for agriculture. We were all involved in agriculture and wanted to see our families stay involved. And it was, um, it was a driving force. And when we went to the legislature, we eventually uh, made our voices known uh, in specific changes. I don't know if we can say that there was a one topic that we directly focused on, but we wanted to make sure that agriculture was heard from and that the future of the province had a big portion of agriculture in it and the provincial policy should include that. One of the driving factors was how do you manage the, uh, the taxes on farmland? and uh, agriculture, agriculture and education, well, one benefits from the other in both ways. 
sometimes the way education taxes were levied on agricultural land, uh, there seemed to be a disconnect. And we, if there was one thing that we didn't uh, complete, completely change, it was that relationship between education tax and agricultural production uh, property because you require vast acres of land or many acres of land to run your operation but the more you had that greater your education tax rose and that was a disconnect that we were unhappy with at the time. Now, did that group on the whole feel that they were rewarded for that passion and the uh, activism that they took as politicians? Oh, we were rewarded in the sense that we felt we made a, a clear voice on behalf of agriculture within provincial government. Some of us had an opportunity to speak on a, a larger platform, but the fact that we were MLAs and we were part of the government gave us that platform. And that was a, an interesting period in history because we went from the problems that we saw prior to being elected to some changes that occurred through into the 90s, which is where I became more involved as I ended up dealing with some of the environmental issues. Glenn Finley, as an example, became very involved in the agricultural issues. So yes, to the extent that we wanted to speak up and be heard and have an opportunity to influence decisions, yeah, we should be happy with that. So when you started to veer as a cabinet minister, for example, and of course you were deputy prime minister at one point, um, did you fully understand the environmental issues that you were dealing with, or did that grow on you? I think it's fair to say it grew on me, but there's an adage that makes some sense when you think about it. Sometimes if you bring a specialist in, in a position like a cabinet minister, they come with a huge amount of preconceived ideas. There's nothing wrong with having an open mind and being willing to look at ideas that you might not have thought of previously. So I had the advantage, even though I considered it a disadvantage when I first got elected, I had the advantage of being able to force myself to have an open mind on a lot of issues. I believe in smaller government, less regulation, and I found myself in a position where I had to deal with a lot of regulation and improving, modernizing, and making them regular, uh, more, breaking the regulation more uh, current, which was something I would never have anticipated. But I always felt that uh, as long as I approached it with an open mind and got good input from the various areas that we were impacting, that we were able to be reasonable in what we did. Well, give me an, an example, if you will, of um, how you, not just you, but you as a person involved, could see the progress that you, are, you were making in matters environmental. Well, there was a lot of changes that occurred in the early 90s or mid-90s in the environmental field, but one that I never anticipated being involved in was the fall that we had a huge uh, smoke problem in the city of Winnipeg because there was a very heavy crop and weather that was uh, conducive to keeping smoke in the area and there was a, a fair bit of stubble burning, you might say a lot of stubble burning that was occurring in the areas close to the city of Winnipeg and that snow, that smoke drifted into the city and caused a lot of trouble and we did not previously have uh, anything other than nuisance regulations to deal with it and we ended up the example what that I personally had if I looked down from a 20 floor apartment down to the street you could barely see the street with the smoke that was b below you so it was certainly impacting in the community there was fire alarms that were going off because of the smoke that was getting into areas that it shouldn't be there was elevators that were being impeded and how they operated in some of the high-rise buildings. So all those things led to a, first of all, we had to have an order, an emergency order to stop the stubble burning. But it 
led to that debate about what kind of environmental regulation makes it so that the people who are the operators and the people who are responsible for getting the work done could function and yet the general population could be satisfied that they didn't have to have an undue amount of interruption to their lifestyle and their health for that matter. And if you look at the premise that was put behind the stubble burning regulation, it didn't say thou shalt not burn. It said that you may burn under these conditions. And it took a while to convince our colleagues in rural Manitoba, because it was not just in the valley, it was all across Manitoba. It took a lot of people to, some time to appreciate that that was the way it was intended to work. There was a lot of uh, laughter and anger in the agricultural community to begin with, but now it's been in place for quite a while and some of the agriculture, in fact a lot of the agricultural practices have changed. So there's not quite as much demand as there used to be, but it is an example of where in a number of occasions we tried to put in place a regulation that was both reasonable and practical and allowed normal activities to continue provided they were done under certain circumstances. Well now, you were close to um, lots of things that weren't very popular at the time. You were, on the, I think, on the hot seat now and then. Um, people weren't happy with you uh, about no-fault insurance, but you moved uh, ahead with that. Um, that affects anybody who has a driver's license in Manitoba or has auto insurance. Like, and uh, how hard a fight was that? Well, the toughest, the toughest sell was probably within caucus because it, in many respects it went against the grain in terms of what most of my colleagues and even myself thought about the way uh, insurance and, and regula regulation and, and manners of matters of risk should be managed. But we were in a situation where Autopac seemed to have got out of control in terms of rising costs. And I remember one person quipping that people were getting whiplash from watching accidents. And the fact was that that type of injury, very hard to deal with, created massive amount of legal uh, wrangling in many cases, not always obviously, but there was an overburden of times that were be things being settled in the court system, which took a lot of time and money. And the one thing that I hung my hat on was an example of a settlement that uh, took uh, a very bad turn. People had, people had been injured very badly and the settlement was for uh, $140,000 $140, and yet under no fault it looked like they would get something like 80000 How do you explain that? Well, as it turns out, the settlement that was the example that I was working from, and one example doesn't make a good law, I understand that, but it is an example of the fact that in this case it took four years to settle it and $40,000 went to the legal expenses. So the person waited four years to get the same amount of money. Now that's not how that money level was set, but it's an example of where <laughs> There was a correlation, actually, that allowed people to think through the fact that maybe this wasn't so bad. It does allow under no fault to recognize that if you're injured and you don't have somebody to sue, which can happen where, you, where it, uh, a single vehicle accident where you cause the accident yourself, if you're badly injured, you can still receive health care, you can still receive medical assistance of all types, including chiropractic, and you can get, if you're injured to the point where you can't keep your job, there's at least some compensation available to you, and yet there would not have been under the tort system necessarily. And it worked very well, I thought, but we, you know, it needs to be under constant review. Uh, the current criticism is that maybe the 
the level of reimbursement is not properly adjusted. But at the same time, we were able to control our insurance costs to where it was reasonable for people to acquire insurance and safely uh, insure their vehicles. It is a situation where it means that younger drivers who are, whether, you, whether we wish to ad admit it or not, statistically younger drivers are known to have more accidents. Other jurisdictions, they can't afford light insurance in some cases, once, especially once they have their first accident. So it, it has its pros and cons, but I will defend the idea of uh, no fault uh, protecting the general public and the driver in it adequately. So as a politician, you found yourself in a position to offend lots of different people. How, how, how did you deal with that? Well, once we, we had worked through all of the arguments within our own caucus and our own government and presented it to the public, um, it went through rather, rather uh, well, frankly. I found that there were people who were the main critics very often either had a vested interest or didn't understand what the, what the coverage might actually be. There, there was the common reference to what is known as the meat chart, which is where there's a loss of finger can return a certain amount to you and that sort of thing. But it did deal with, deal with it on, a, on what almost looks like a very crass uh, approach. But again, the example of a catastrophic accident that there's nobody around to sue or you can't sue a deer when they come through the window of your automobile and that sort of thing, or a moose, that uh, person is more adequately protected under this system than they would be under a tort system. How did you deal with the, the stress of these battles? I went home and drove the tractor for <laughs> some time on the weekend. <laughs> no, I was, uh, that actually was an outlet for me. It was completely different but I did always carry a cell phone. And I have to admit that uh, the final decision on selling the Manitoba Hazardous Waste Corporation to a private interest was uh, a conversation that I had with the people who were doing the negotiating while I was sitting in the wheel well of my tractor in my field talking to them on a cell phone. It was modern technology allowed me to do a little bit of that it didn't mean that I was not paying attention. It just meant that I was on the job seven days a week sometimes. Now, your, your influence reached much further than you might have imagined when you started out. I mean, you started out very, very locally in terms of issues and then went provincially. And, and then you were exposed to international ideas and international thinking. Um, what what involvement did you finally have in in the, let's say an environment environmental issue like recycling? Somebody is going to say, "Oh, recycling! How dull is that?" Right. Well, it is pretty dull, but it gets exciting when you have to tell some municipalities that perhaps they should shut down their uh, landfills. The two are connected. If you uh, and that's what happened. We put in place regulations to provide for waste removal from the, uh, the uh, waste stream, uh, things that were recyclable, tires and so on. We set in place regulation where the industry could move its, uh, its focus on not just selling tires, but also taking them back and finding a, home, a, a final resting place for them after they're worn out. And it became uh, one of the more successful uh, recycling programs in the country. It also created a uh, interesting dynamic. There were thousands and thousands of tires that had been left in the country, in yards and various other places. So obviously the first few years, we our percentage of recycled rubber went up astronomically. It was one of the best programs in the country at that time. And we never had the, 
likes of the Hagersville Tire Fire. Tell, tell us a bit about that. Well, that was a connection where a very large pile of tires at Hager, the town of Hagersville. I've never actually been there, but I have a picture of it as I ended up in the office of the Minister of Environment in Ontario. And he stood me up because that was the day the fire broke out at Hagersville and he went out in a plane to see how bad the fire was. Now, a recycling program would have saved that, and Ontario, of course, has dealt with it, but large collections of that type of material was a, was a dangerous situation. We also had an influence at that time in enforcing the pesticide container industry to uh, remove their, find a way of removing their pesticide containers from the landfill or taking, making sure that they were clean before they went to be collected. We had an opportunity to put in place uh, curbside re recycling. And basically what we did with the requiring the industry to set aside money to uh, offset the cost of recycling their products made it possible for us to make money available to the municipalities of all sizes, from Winnipeg to the smallest municipality that had a landfill, to recover some of that money to be used to improve their waste handling uh, process. It was a little complicated, but it's standalone. It's, uh, it's not a crown corporation, it's a non-profit organization. People who criticize it, and I, even today I hear criticizing well, it's an, of it being, well, it's just another government-run program. It's run under the auspices of government regulation, yes, but it's non-profit and it uh, is meant to assist the municipalities whose primary responsibility for is lies with them for uh, removing uh, recyclables and at the same time we were doing that we uh, began to slowly enforce again the key being what I thought was on a reasonable basis require municipalities that ran landfills to stop burning in their landfills and to uh, make sure that the landfills were located where there was no opportunity to pollute groundwater. And that's really the one of the, aside from the fact that you can get methane gas coming out of a, a poorly managed landfill, you can also contaminate in a very bad way uh, la uh, groundwater. Interesting enough, not only here but almost everywhere, gravel pits that have been dug out was a hole in the ground that people today, and I don't blame them, they thought, well, there's a wasted piece of ground, we can, use, we can fill it with garbage, in which many of them did. But there was too many opportunities under a circumstance like that for, for, to have some possibility of seeping into a gravel seam that may have been left there somewhere. And that was a, that was a big benefit, and that was very difficult to uh, very difficult discussion with the municipalities because they felt it was interfering in their ability to manage their waste and their landfills. And yet there was a smattering of uh, very committed people within the municipal structure who realized that this is where the future was going to take them, whether they wanted to go or not. And We had some very good people in the department who were good politicians in their own right. They'd go out and meet with the municipality and come out of there smiling on both sides because they, you know, we'll put in some test holes and work from there. And that's usually what happened. So it seems to me that, you know, in, in the course of your more than 20 year um, career in, in politics, that you had to aggravate a lot of, a lot of people <laughs> in your base, right? Well, yes, although I have to say that I never got any hate mail. I, uh, I found that people were reasonable if you treat them with respect and, and explain to them as best you can what it, the intention is that you're trying to uh, create. And I was also riding a wave of, of uh, a new generation that was becoming more and more concerned about environment and uh, cost of uh, government involved 
uh, programs, which refers to the autopack situation that we inherited. It was a political hot potato. But we did manage, I think, to put in reasonable regulations and reasonable expectations in both cases. But all of this has to be looked at in uh, today's light and be continually reviewed. That's what makes it all work, in my opinion especially the insurance and the environmental regulations. It's easy to put in more and more stringent environmental regulations. It's not easy to justify them in every case. I mean, walking on this earth, we, we bend some grass and <laughs> burn some trees. It, it just, society has an impact on the environment. So when you're in agriculture, for example, you're clearing trees, you're, you're uh, moving dirt, and you're draining. There's some water drainage that goes on, and really the most difficult situation was when, between environment and natural resources, we began to enforce more regulations according to the Water Rights Act and to the, to the uh, Provincial Planning Act that would require people to justify more of their drainage activities. And that really was where there was a lot of blowback. People believed it was their land, and it is, but they felt that there was no right on anybody's part to interfere with their intention as to how they wanted to handle that. So there is an impact from drainage, and uh, I think it's being handled reasonable, but there's certainly arguments being made out there today that uh, we've gone a long ways on drainage. Maybe we've gone too far in some cases, but there's a big difference between moving some water around on flatland and as opposed to moving water where there's a steep fall and you have erosion and you have uh, downstream damages that are unintended and all those things. So that was really the toughest file, believe it or not. Hmm. So through all of this, these issues in this time period, you were in in some ways like a, led the politician's dream life, right? because you just kept getting reelected, Mr. Unbeatable. Um, what was the key to that? Well, I spent a lot of time traveling in the constituency uh, when I first began as a uh, get involved in a in a bigger scale. I started campaigning for a full year before the election was called. So I traveled up into areas that were an hour and a half away from me, to, to, which were also in the constituency, up to Crane River, Rourke, and Tootsade. Uh, I, one of the things I used to tease some of my colleagues about in the, uh, in the legislature, did you know where Bacon Ridge and Silver Ridge are? And why don't you? I mean. Those were two communities in the north part of my constituency that uh, needed to get to be known in. Now, I was involved with my father in purebred livestock, and I got to know some of the livestock producers or had a reputation with some of the livestock producers in the nor northern part of the constituency, which is a big cattle area. And that allowed me to have an intro into the area and, and talk to people. And uh, I was able to forge some very strong connections with certain members of the community and they stuck by me fortunately they uh, like they you know there's a difference in a rural constituency in those days than what there might be in an urban constituency then and now if you had people in the area that were known in the area that would go out and actually work for you that was a big factor in terms of people starting to feel like they actually knew you and uh, my policy in my uh, office and for myself was if somebody had a letter or a phone call that they made into the office that they would get a phone call back had to have as an example one fellow who lost his driver's license and I said well you got to give me permission to look at your uh, transcript. I said, I really can't do anything about it. And I phoned him back and I had to tell him, you know, if I had final say on this, I wouldn't give you your driver's license back either. 
I think he still voted for me, though, because he knew that I at least tr looked at it and decided that he had nothing to complain about. But that's not anything that we could have done anything about. I don't mean to imply that we could have, but it was the type of relationship that any politician needs to develop with his constituents or he won't be there long. So uh, would you say, would you encourage a young person who wants to change the world, who believes that the world can be changed. Would you encourage that person to go into politics now? Oh, definitely. But one thing that I would uh, stress is you need to be willing to approach the job with an open mind. Those who have, I had, I had a reason to get involved, but it, I, I also knew at the time that I needed to uh, represent more than just my own narrow interests. We had businessmen, we had uh, teachers, we had professionals all across the constituency. We had a lot more than agriculture going on, and I needed to have a relationship with the with the other people as well, or you can't you can't uh, represent them. But there's a one adage that I've tried to stick to and that is you can be famous or you can be infamous but you can't be both and that's that not necessarily an adage that most people might think about when they're uh, getting involved in politics but you can influence the direction of things in our modern society through government it is i i'm offended by the argument that uh, people believe that we all are uh, tin soldiers following a leader in today's parliamentary system, even in Ottawa. I'm sure that the caucus members there, well, they may be one out of 200, if they are a strong person and have strong opportunities, and if they, this is why the leadership is so important, if they have an opportunity to speak out on, on issues, they can accomplish something they can influence the people who are actually going to do something by providing them counsel, providing them an opinion, providing them with a, with a reference point, if you wish. For example, I'm an advocate, and this is not popular in some areas, but I'm an advocate of uh, the hog industry. It provided hundreds of jobs across Western Canada. My local community has hundreds of jobs, frankly, just in the community. We have a double shift of uh, processing hogs and if uh, people had not had the opportunity and the uh, support to uh, go ahead and build that plant in the first place and the initiative to build it and the cooperation of the community there were community leaders who had as much or more influence than I did but they knew that they had the support of people along with their elected representatives at, in Winnipeg, for example, to make it happen. And it's paid off. So it sounds like you would certainly do it all again. Yeah, it was hard on the family to some extent. My kids were 9 and 11, I think, when I got elected. But there were, you know, a lot of weekends when I could uh, swing by wherever the kids were playing hockey. And... Uh, my daughter's activities. I didn't get there as many times as I should. Uh, if I hadn't had uh, my wife to be as supportive and, and my family, they all worked a little bit extra overtime uh, to make up for the fact that I wasn't there helping with the farm. And that became increasingly so as I got busier and busier. Um, well, I think we've covered a lot. What do you think? Do we, is there something that you haven't had a chance to say? I mean, we talked. No, we can, yeah. <laughs> we, there's, there's so many different threads that, that happened. It was, uh, it was like a boom box in my office there sometimes. But I, I think, what do you think, Zach? Do you get a, you get a sense of the challenges that he had and the results and um, some good, some nice images 
I, I love the image of you thinking in your tractor. <laughs> thinking, right? Well, some people might not uh, see it that way. I'm glad that you interpret it that way. Oh, it's a uh, meditative place to be. People, actually, this one of the places where a lot of people listen to the CBC. You know, they would listen to the CBC in their in their tractors. Well, now I've got about four or five hours cutting grass around the farm, so I go into my lawnmower. Oh, no. <laughs> kind of like, downscale. And I like the you know the fact that you've shown us um, the the intricacies of regulation. You know, and the the balance the balance of, uh, of um, moving forward and allowing people their freedom at the same time. Yeah, you know that, I'm glad you see that. I was thinking about it this morning because uh, of... Do you uh, want to just take this? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, Would well, you start again because I was thinking about it. <laughs> no, no, I, got, but, I oh. kept the recording. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, well, something that is of interest, I think, about the, the regulatory aspect. It also is very important that there be an opportunity for, to, for people to be receive information. It sounds almost high-handed to say provide education for the, for the uh, community, if you will. It, it's better to describe it as information. Most people will make up their minds in a particular way if you give them all the information that's available. And I, when I was in, first in politics, I, I had maybe a better sense of humor than I have now, but I was in rural, some rural meetings once in a while and something came up about environmental questions. And I used to look at them and say, well, what do you consider the most damaging activity on the face of the earth? And somebody would say mining, Somebody would say uh, another, you know, timber harvesting. Well, no, agriculture clears more land and restores it to a monoculture than almost any other activity, and I'm a farmer. I mean, that's how we live on this planet. We have to grow, feed, you know, foodstuffs for ourselves, uh, foodstuffs for our livestock. If you think of it that way, the activity needs to continue unless it's reached a point where the land is being degraded for some reason. Or as you know in some African nations where it's starting to turn into a desert because of bad practices, it can turn into a desert here if we don't continue with modern practices which are intended to provide conservation to the soil. So it's that type of thing that once people start thinking about it, once in that case, they used to get, take them a minute to get past being insulted. But the second part of it is that uh, when they thought about it, in reality, they realized that they had a responsibility and that they would deal with it. I have a twisted mind. <laughs> Good. So are you happy with, with what we've done? Sure. Yeah, I mean... Been a fair treatment of the. Oh, yeah. And remember it always. You're the only thing. reporter that lets me talk. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah. Okay, then.